Welcome to Find the Way with Dr. Mike Sherboneau. Find the Way is your program helping you find hope for this road called life. This is a program that addresses the issues of life by understanding where God is in the midst of it all. Join us for the next half hour to regain perspective, purpose, and the passion for the journey you are on today. Well, good morning to all our listeners, and hello, Mike. Welcome back to the studio. Well, thank you, Ashley, and I'm glad you're here. And I also want to just say a special Mother's Day welcome, greeting, hello uh, to all the moms that are listening out there. You know, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. And I know that's kind of a lame start, but where do you go when it comes to Mother's Day they're just, we just want to honor you and let you know how much you are loved uh, by all of us. So we uh, tip our hats to you today. Ashley, here's your chance well, to say something. Well, I would just like to say I have the best mom in the world, so that's not even up for argument. But, you know, I've often wondered, how did she do it all? Five girls. I don't think she ever slept an ounce. She would be up making presents, making our lunches, doing everything else. Mom, I just admire the way you did everything for us all those years. But most of all, and the most significant thing today is knowing my mom loves me. And that's what I feel, even when I'm miles away from her, knowing her embrace, knowing that she thinks so highly of me. So thank you, Mom, for your love that has helped to knit me together as a woman. Ashley, if I can piggyback off of that comment, uh, you said knowing that my mom loves me, that gives you strength and uh, I- encouragement and you know, the perseverance to go on with life. And not everyone has had that experience. And so we want to recognize that. But I also know that today, for all of us who've ever felt like we failed, we haven't measured up as a parent or as a sibling or whatever, that today is a day for fresh beginning. Because as we unpack who we are in Christ, as we understand our identity, that gives us energy to press on. And if I can just be transparent right now, I've been coming through a a real difficult season of life. And, uh, you know, where you feel a bit like a failure, things haven't worked out quite the way that you had hoped, and you're wondering, God, you know, at my age, why are you scripting it this way? And then suddenly here I am, I'm sharing this message almost across our country, and I believe there's a reason. It's because I have discovered who I am in Christ, that even though many people say, oh, you're a failure, you didn't measure up, you could have done this better, and blah, 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 and I'm just feeling good about doing that on the radio, <laughs> so like, who's going to stop me right now, except Dwayne, our producer, when people say that they want to rain on your parade i want to stand up and say let me tell you jesus loves me jesus cares for me ashley you live in Kelowna, and there's a guy there who has shaped your life and mine an older guy i call him he's the the danny devito look-alike uh stan (laughs) big stan i hope you're listening and everybody knows stan everybody knows stan and uh, one of the things that has shaped his life has been down syndrome I had a brother who had Down syndrome, and Stan has a son, uh, Jonathan. But Jonathan is there with the uh, Kelowna Rockets. He's part of that hockey team. Everybody knows Jonathan in in the city as much as anyone else. He's famous. He's a celebrity. And and Jonathan, in his broken English, he would often remind his dad, and his dad would remind me one amazing little truth. And he would say, Dad. And he would say, Da, Jesus loves you. And that young man, even though the world might say he's a simpleton, he's more profound than any professor at Yale or Harvard that you could imagine because he knows a truth that has become bedrock in his life. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? And that's, that's where we all need to be at, to have that kind of identity, that in the midst of everything else in life that we look and we go, Jesus loves me, and that's the most important thing to me. And not everybody understands that. And some of you are listening, they say, I'm not going to buy that. I'm not sure about it. Or maybe that's just for weak people. Maybe that's just for weak people. And, and what about Jesus? What about other faiths and, and things like that? We're going to address that today, and we're going to talk about what real theology is. And theology means the knowledge of God. The knowledge of especially of how not just who God is, but how he thinks about us. And when we understand that, that will strengthen us. A powerful song has come out. We're going to listen to part of it. It's by Hillsong Worship. It's called The Creed. It's about what we believe. And this will help us as we unpack the book of Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to listen to it, and then I'll be right back. Christ the 
Welcome back to all our listeners. You're listening to us at Find the Way and online it's findtheway.faith. There's a place there that you can support our ministries. Also, if you'd like to hear radio shows from the past, you can also listen online on that website. Well, we're back here with Mike and uh, you're going to pick up the series on identity and talk to us about the book of Ephesians. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, while we're celebrating this Mother's Day, uh, the person that came to my mind as we unpacked the book of Ephesians was uh, my grandfather. And uh, my grandfather was an interesting fellow. Uh, He was a man who... um, you know, sometimes we wondered uh, what he was up to. Maybe it wasn't always good, uh, but it wasn't always bad. And uh, he 
he was a, a politician. He was a wheeler dealer. Uh, he was also a real estate uh, icon in the little community that we lived in. And uh, But in his own journey, he didn't have room for Jesus. He was the focus of my mother's prayers as she prayed for him that he would be able to make sense out of his life. And I remember when I was 17 years of age, I just decided that, you know, I was going to go to a Bible college and, and I wanted to follow this nudge in my heart that I thought was crazy. I'm sure God wanted me to be a hockey player, but here I am. I'm, I'm going to a college and saying, I, I'm going to, I'm going to sh- be a minister, whatever that meant. But I, my grandfather uh, got sick and he was in hospital and he was in his early nineties at that point. But I remember going in to see him and when he was there in hospital, he realized how much he needed a savior that the one he'd been running from for all his life was the one he really needed to run to. And he looked at me after he had put his faith and trust in Jesus. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, Michael, I only wish that I had trusted him sooner. Mm -hmm. I'm sharing that story today because some of you have your arms up at God like my grandfather did. I'm grateful that instead of always going through life with his arms up, he was willing to receive God's love in his own journey. But sometimes we say, I don't need God. I can do it on my own. And we need to realize that we can't. Like Noah last week was talking about the strength of his faith as a young man going through with cancer. Uh, He knew that God would be the one who would sustain him and keep him. And my grandfather discovered that late in life. But one of the many things that endeared him to me was the fact that he was also an auctioneer. And somehow I can hardly walk by a sale without wanting to go in and buy something. And there are many times, as you know, Ashley, that I just want to get up on the block and try to sell things. I love selling, buying and selling things. And and maybe if I if I stop doing radio, I'll, I'll become an auctioneer because I just love that dynamic, that energy. Well, that also fits into why you always wanted us to have a hot dog stand and be out there selling hot dogs, right? Yeah. Hey, it's a great living. Perfect great... summer employment. You can talk to people. And when I met a guy who, you know, Every week he was making three grand a week selling hot dogs. I'm thinking that guy's a whole lot smarter than me and than a lot of other people. <laughs> but as we talk about being at the hot dog stand or we talk about being the auctioneer, we come to the book of Ephesians. And in the book of Ephesians, we read something about Jesus. As we've been listening to the creed by Hillsong Worship, we read in verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. You see, the word redemption is is the picture of the auction stand. But it's not kind of the fun auction that we think of. It was actually a very painful reference. It referred to the auctioning of slaves. And slaves would be auctioned off to the highest bidder. And they would then have to give in to the women fancy. And oftentimes it was outrageous and awful things that would happen to them. A number of years ago, uh, maybe four years now, I was preaching in Ghana, Africa, and I went to the place where the slaves were hoarded into that uh, holding tank and they were sent out to different parts of the world. And as I forced myself to listen to the stories, all I could hear were stories of pain and anguish, the things that were done to men, the horrific things that were done to women as they were sent off into slavery. And that becomes the backdrop to the picture here in the book of Ephesians when it says we were trapped, we were slaves. And then it says this beautiful phrase, in Jesus though we have redemption because it was sin that had enslaved us. And he says, now because of what Christ has done, the debt has been paid in full. The word speaks of a slave on the auction block who is purchased by someone to be their own. And sin was my owner. It was your owner, Ashley. It's the owner of everyone listening today. But Jesus has paid for our redemption so that we no longer have to live in bondage. The natural carryover for that is what he says in the next phrase, in him we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. No longer do we have to be held captive. Forgiveness is a wonderful word. It's wonderful to be forgiven and to be told that we're in accordance, as the Bible says, with the riches of God's grace that he's lavished on us. This phrase captures so much the heart of God for you and I that I don't think we'll ever fully understand it until we get to heaven. 
It says that he lavishes on us forgiveness. When I think of lavish, I think of the way that I love to eat hot bread. You know, I like to slice it. I like to put butter on it. And and no one, please don't gag on this, but then I like smooth peanut butter on top of the butter. And don't be chintzy. Lavish it on. And nothing organic, right? And nothing organic, yeah. And I like steroids too, but that's a whole other subject. So, uh, you know, you know, anyways, we'll get off track there, but it's lavished on. And it says that God lavishes on us forgiveness. Many people are just overwhelmed with the pain of the past. They've maybe experienced an, or, an abortion. Maybe they've gone through that. They've been a victim of abuse. Some people listening in today, um, You've had horrific things said to you. There have been words of discouragement that just have been repeated in your memory. But God comes and says, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. You've been set free. And the reason Jesus has the authority to do that is that he's redeemed us. He has paid the price for all my sin on the auction block when he died on the cross for you and me. I was traveling a while ago, and I knew I was going to get in late to the place where I was staying. It was a, a, it was a house that hosts people that are traveling. And so I uh, texted the person. I said, I, the hostess, I said, I apologize for being late. And she sent me a little email. It was meant to be tongue-in-cheek. And she said, I will forgive you this time. And I knew what she meant. And, and she's a great person. I was going to be late, but she said, I'll forgive you this time. But the next time, don't mess up. I'm grateful that I have a heavenly father who doesn't send texts like that, where he says, I'll forgive you just this time. But he sends it out all the time. He says, my forgiveness is what's described in the riches of his grace. Grace is God giving us what I don't deserve. And it's because of his grace that I do not have to wallow in shame or condemnation. And so if you've been listening to the whole show, you've listened to that Hillsong uh, worship song on the creed and the power of that song. It's because it's all surrounded by this subject that we call God's grace. We don't have to be prisoners any longer because Jesus is the way. He lavishes on us forgiveness, and as we enter into that incredible truth and the freedom that comes from it, we discover what so many people are looking for. It's the purpose in life, the mystery of his will, the mystery of his will that God loves the world, that Christ came so that you and I can be one with God. And our task and my task is to share that good news and to be the good news. And that's why Find the Way is here, because we believe that as we've experienced God's forgiveness and love in our life, we want to share that with you so that you'll no longer be captive to the many things we've been talking about, especially these last couple weeks, that you won't be captive to the fact, the illusion of thinking, if I get likes on Facebook, if I get a response to my Instagram post, that people really love me, that I'm really special. If I get a pay raise, that my security is found in that. Oh, well, I got the basis covered for the next little while. I've got five grand in the bank or 10 grand in the bank. I keep being reminded of that guy, Nelson Rockefeller. I referred to him about six weeks ago on the show when at one point he was the wealthiest person in the world. And he said, someone said, Mr. Rockefeller, how much money do you have to have to be happy? And he responded, just a little bit more. We laugh at that, but we get so caught up with the more monster, don't we, Ashley? We just want to get tied into that. What are your thoughts on, on the desire for more? And as we think about it in contrast to the grace that God has given to us. Well, I think actually what the problem is, is that we are thinking we're wanting more, but all the things we're wanting more of aren't really the things that satisfy us at all anyways. It just leaves us with more emptiness. And we get it. And then we, we say, that's not enough, isn't every, it? Everything has an expiry date. And that bugs me, but I still know it and I still fall prey to that. Oh, yeah. And it was Madonna who said after, you know, one of her Grammys that she had won and putting out another album, probably one of the most successful 50-year-old artists of all times, right? Exactly. She says, it doesn't matter how much I get and how much more I do, it's never actually enough. Never enough. And so as we're talking about this, that Jesus is enough, I think a legitimate question for people listening in would be, is that really true? And how do you prove it? How do you prove that Jesus is more than enough? When we started this series of talks in the book of Ephesians, I used that, I shared the uh, illustration, the experience I had driving down the road and seeing the Walmart sign. And uh, 
as it bugged me, the more and more I thought about the Walmart sign that said that God is like Walmart. He's, he's everywhere and he's got everything. It just irked me. And so we've been unpacking the truth that there are actually signs in this passage that God wants, I believe, written out saying, here is the real truth. And here's a sign about what we've just talked about, Ashley. It says the Holy Spirit within us is the one, it's the witness of the Holy Spirit that says Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He is more than enough. It's what Noah talked about last week and knowing that as he walked through the battle of cancer, that Jesus would be enough for him. It's what Bill Hogg was talking about it, the three weeks prior to Noah being on the show as we talked about more about identity and who we are in Christ, that Jesus is more than enough. But many times people say, prove it. How do I know? How do I know for sure? Let me suggest this. I want to read to you the last portion of Ephesians 1, verses 11 to 13, because it explains how that we know. It says, In Jesus we were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. In other words, it says that God chose us. There's that big word predestined, which means that our lives are mapped out with a boundary, that nothing happens by chance. And it says, according to the plan of God who works out everything to comply with his plan. In other words, not just from the choices we make today, but even as we're listening to the radio program, it's not by chance. God wants you to hear this truth. I firmly believe that as we're sharing today, we're speaking into the lives of people. We might be speaking to the lives of mothers who are saying, man, I messed up. God wants you to know that whether or not that's true or not, it's what you feel that today is a new beginning. And God has an incredible way of making trophies out of trash cans. The pain of my mistakes, I don't have to allow to be the, what identifies me, but it's the fact that I'm forgiven, that I'm loved by him. And so you say, how do I know that for sure? Well, he's going to tell us. He said, it's the spirit who lives within us, that when I trust in Christ, his Holy Spirit comes and dwells within me supernatural. And it says, you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory and grace. Let me explain that just in a very simple way in the minutes that we have remaining today. It says you were included in Christ. I'm sure many of our listeners can identify in some way to what I experienced as a young kid. I remember growing up in Ottawa, in the winter months, we'd go down to the local hockey rink. I loved to play pickup hockey. And, you know, we'd line up against the boards, and the oldest kids would pick the teams. The two hot dogs, the, the jocks would go out, and they would pick the team. And we all desperately wanted to be picked the first two or three people. I remember the feeling if I was the last one to be picked. You know, just feeling, oh, well, I'm the leftover. I'm the dregs. Many times we feel that in life. Just because of what has happened to us, we've been riding the pinnacle of success and suddenly our world crashes. Uh, I've pastored in churches and suddenly I haven't been pastoring in churches. I've had businesses and sometimes they've worked and sometimes they haven't worked the way that I've wanted to. Sometimes I've lived in different parts of the country and as I've journeyed and as I've persevered on, I've discovered that sometimes people will turn against you, even people that you think are their, your closest friends and you wonder why and you think you hear what people say about you and say is that true and those words can cut so deep so I'm being pretty vulnerable here today but I want you to know that what has helped sustain me is the fact that I've known I'm included in Christ it's what he says here because the day I put my trust in Jesus something supernatural happened and what was supernatural was the fact that Christ's presence came and dwelt within me And there's a lot of competing voices out there to say at times that we are not loved, that we're not successful, and and all of that. But there's a stronger voice. It's the still small voice of God. It's his spirit that says, you're forgiven. You are loved, that you are precious to me. You know, I remember in one situation in church I was pastoring, when we ask, how do I really know that it's true that the Holy Spirit is there? A lady shared with me how a co-worker had talked to her about who Jesus was for 10 years. He kept inviting her to come to church with him. 
uh, and eventually she showed up at church with this man and his wife. It took 10 years. And then when she came to church, she just told me what happened because it was a church that I was pastoring at that time. She said that when the music began, it just began to wash over her. And suddenly she began to weep and she couldn't hold back the tears. It was like her heart was um, just bursting forth like a dam. And uh, then she said when God's word was preached, it all began to make sense in her heart, which she was experiencing. For 10 years, she'd held her hands up at God. Think about the story about my grandfather earlier in this talk, how for over 90 years, he'd held his hands up at God. But then he opened up and began to receive. And he said, if only I trusted him sooner. Well, I talked to this woman after the fact, and while she didn't use those exact words, it was the same sentiments. I only wish that I had trusted him sooner. What kept the Apostle Paul persevering while he was sitting in a Roman jail cell was the fact that he knew that God loved him. The witness of the Holy Spirit in his life, the supernatural activity of the Spirit was saying, this is true. You see, it's the Spirit's presence that gives us hope for the journey. I can say that your life is not by chance, and I can say that everything about your life has been laid out by the Lord. But you're going to be asking the question, well, how do I know? Well, friend, there's no way that I can persuade you. There's no way that I can argue logic, but what I can do is encourage you to open up your heart and faith for a supernatural encounter with God's Holy Spirit today. It's the Holy Spirit who gives you a hunger to know God. It's the Holy Spirit that is whispering in your heart, keep listening to the words of what this guy and this woman is saying to you on the radio today. As strange as it sounds, this is truth. It's the Holy Spirit who says, trust in Jesus. Enter into his forgiveness because you can be forgiven. Mike, I want to interject right there and just stop and say, what do you mean we can be forgiven? Like my friend's husband just cheated on her recently. Is that the kind of forgiveness that's offered? See, Ashley, we really struggle with forgiveness, don't we? Because uh, what I've done is wrong is not as bad as the other guy. But here, here, if we think about that whole story of what you just said, the question is this. He can go to the wife, and if he said to her, will you forgive me, uh, working through that is a whole journey in itself. But say she chooses not to forgive. Say it's the person who's the molester, who's the abuser, Uh, the Hitlers of the world and all those things saying, how do we forgive those people? The bigger question I think in our minds is, can God forgive them? And is his forgiveness enough? What do you think about that? Well, is his forgiveness enough? And then how do I even forgive myself? Right? Exactly. Forgiving ourselves because let's say I'm the person who's been unfaithful to my spouse. Um, you know, the regret, the shame that goes with that and not just with that type of sin, but with any kind of sin, whether we lie, whether we cheat, we steal. Uh, we do things that, you know, when I pretend to be someone that I'm not, even as a father, uh, and, you know, as kids say, oh, you haven't lived up to the expectation. We feel like failures. So it's looking essentially at the cross and seeing what Jesus has done and saying that's restoring even this screw up right here in my life. And people want to remind us of our screw ups. I mean, I know that, you know that. You know, the final part of this verse, it says we are included in Christ. And the picture of being included is saying, even when the world says I'm a screw up, Jesus still including, he says, Mike, there's still room for you in my family. And that's the powerful part of the story that I can't understand, but I'm really glad for. So you been talking about Ephesians, you look at this whole thing of the blessing, being chosen, the spirit dwelling within us, and this whole notion of forgiveness. This is really the hope, and this is the identity that we begin to rest upon. Yeah, and as we talk about the things that we don't understand, like how could God ever forgive that person, I'm more concerned about how could he forgive me? And and forgiveness is, is a powerful thing. Maybe some of our listeners are saying, well, how, how do I get forgiveness? What do I do? Do I buy it? No, it's, it's a gift. God has paid for our sins, the Bible teaches us. People will say, well, well, how do I know that? How do I get to know Christ? And I often say this, there's a simple prayer that when prayed from your heart to God, He's promised to hear. It's a prayer like this that I want to invite us to pray together right now to say, Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner. You know I've failed. You know I've messed up. But today I'm opening up my heart to you. I'm believing that you've paid the price for my sin. Take me off that auction block. Help me to know that I'm included in you. And I'm believing that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit today. 
Thank you, Dr. Mike. You've been listening to Find the Way, and you can find us online at findtheway.faith.